Okay. All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to uh, our first presentation in the spring 2020 iteration of the Online Peace Science Colloquium. I'm one of your co-hosts, uh, Brad Smith. I'm an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. I host this along with Cassie Dorf, who is my uh, colleague here. She's also an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. We are an online forum affiliated with the Peace Science Society. Um, and our goal is to bring the great research that happens at the uh, annual meeting of the Peace Science Society uh, to you all year round. So today we have a very nice paper. Uh, it's going to be presented by Chris Blair, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. It's titled Border Control and Insurgent Tactics. And we have a great pair of discussants today to give feedback on the paper. We have Sarah Polo, who's an assistant professor at the University of Essex as well as Evan Perkoski, who's an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut. So ground rules, pretty simple. We'll have uh, Christopher present for 15 to 20 minutes, um, and then we'll follow that up with some discussion. We'll try to wrap it up in just about an hour. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Chris, and if everybody could mute their microphones, uh, except for Chris. <laughs> OK, can you hear me and see the screen? Um, all right. Green so screen is not up yet for me. Oh, it's not? Okay. Weird. All right. There it is. Now. Okay. So, yeah, thank you to Brad and Cassie for, for organizing. Uh, to He Sun, who was the, the graduate assistant who was helping set this up. And then also to Sarah and Evan, of course. I'm really looking forward to the feedback uh, on this paper. Um, and yeah, again, I'm studying border control and insurgent tactics in the context of Iraq today. So, the focus when we think about border control uh, is often, you know, the, the Trump's wall with Mexico uh, or maybe other walls built in Bulgaria, for instance, uh, to stop uh, the flow of migrants into Europe. Uh, but we've also seen a more substantial proliferation of, of walls and other sorts of border barriers, border fortifications in war zones. In the top left here, you see the berm in uh, Morocco uh, and Western Sahara. To the right of that, Turkey's recently completed wall on the border with Syria, uh, which is you know, a subject even this week of, of the fighting in Idlib. Uh, below that, India's wall with uh, Myanmar, which again uh, is, is in large part about cross-border militancy. And then Finally, in the bottom left corner, Kenya's uh, much maligned wall on the border with Somalia, which they recently stopped construction on over massive corruption. Uh, but anyway, we've seen this proliferation of walls in the context of war zones in a way that sort of defies conventional political economy or, or straightforward conventional political economy explanations uh, for, for border hardening. Um, another, a, a number of other examples here of recent or planned counterinsurgent border fortifications. Uh, the U.S., for instance, has subsidized um, Jordan's wall on the border with Syria as well. Upwards of $100 million since 2016 have gone to that effort. So it's, it's a widespread phenomenon that, that I'm studying here, and it's becoming more common over time, particularly after 9-11. Uh, and in the broader dissertation project that this is coming out of, uh, I do a number of things. So first, documenting this correlation between transnational rebellion and border hardening, uh, and also tracing it uh, in, in some part to U.S. aid and training programs for border security after 9-11. Uh, I introduce new time series cross-sectional data on counterinsurgent border control efforts um, over time. I use some ar archival evidence in a theory building case on uh, French efforts in the Algerian war. You got a taste of that in this paper, but it's a, it's a full chapter of the dissertation. Uh, and then three more micro level chapters, which use declassified or restricted access data. Uh, so today I'm presenting results from a difference in differences design on coalition border fortification and insurgent tactics in Iraq between 2003 and 2009. Uh, in other chapters, I use restricted ac access survey data gathered by ISAF in Afghanistan on attitudes about border security, smuggling, and government legit legitimacy, among other things. Uh, and then another paper uh, uses difference in differences in an instrumental variable uh, to study the effect of U.S. aid to Pakistani border forces on insurgent violence across the Durand line 
Uh, and those are both in earlier stages of development right now, but the data is, is at hand. The implications, I think, of the broader project are, uh, are numerous and, and important. Uh, so one, showing that the kind of political economy explanations for, for border control can't suffice alone. They are important, and, I, and I'm not denying that, but there's also a security logic, I argue, uh, to framing the transnational nature of rebellion as a subject of contestation in and of itself. Uh, dominant theoretical accounts often treat whether rebels have access to cross-border safe havens uh, as a fixed feature uh, and not something that insurgents and counterinsurgents are fighting back and forth over. Uh, but that has important um, effects on conflict dynamics, I show. Uh, I think it extends the existing theories linking rebel resources and the production of violence, uh, introducing in this paper what I call the fortification dilemma. In short, border fortification can diminish insurgent resources by interdicting transnational logistical networks. That's a good thing, uh, but it can also trigger insurgents to compete more for local civilian loyalties, uh, which complicates counterinsurgency operations and necessitates a more population-centric approach. A fifth implication is that wartime smuggling networks are central to insurgent violence. Uh, these are very difficult to study. Uh, and the broader project outlines some new avenues for more micro level work on the study of borders and border control. In this paper, obviously, I'm asking how do counterinsurgent border control efforts affect insurgent tactics? And there's some diverse perspectives here. Paul Staniland, among others, is pretty sanguine about the, the prospects uh, of using border barriers and other forms of border control uh, to reduce the resources flowing to transnational insurgents. Uh, and so in this 2005 Washington Quarterly article, Stan Land, who's studying Iraq, uh, is, is pretty optimistic about the prospects for border control. George Patton, on the other hand, obviously a, a general and mil military practitioner, uh, was much less optimistic about the prospect of fixed fortifications um, to, to do anything to interdict, uh, you know, violent campaigns. And the answer is somewhere in between these perspectives. It's, it's complicated how border control and specifically border fortification affects insurgent violence. There are important trade-offs involved, though, for counterinsurgents that might contemplate this strategy. Classical counterinsurgency theory uh, suggests that, that fortifying your borders in the face of transnational insurgency uh, is deeply important. Insurgents have strong incentives to go transnational, both to augment resources, recruit and procure goods externally, to shelter from the path of counterinsurgent operations, uh, and then possibly also some symbolic incentives to dissolve or alter borders. Uh, the implication here is that victorious counterinsurgents must evaporate insurgent resources, and so uh, counterinsurgent border control should be an imperative against transnational insurgents. This is something that comes out of prominent work by Ladies and Wolf, Staniland, as well as the, uh, the Army Marine Corps field manual uh, that Petraeus and others wrote in the context of Iraq. So the theory in this paper, uh, and I'm going to be pretty brief elaborating it, uh, builds on the existing work on resources and tactics, right? So we know conventional attacks require greater capabilities and risk to insurgents. And so these are things uh, that are increasing with resource endowments. Better resource rebels uh, can produce more uh, sophisticated attacks, conventional uh, and, and high risk attacks. By contrast, irregular attacks are less risky, less manpower intensive. And so these are typically decreasing or increasing with resource losses, de decreasing with resource endowments. Uh, this builds on, on canonical work by Weinstein, Carter, right? We also know uh, specifically that civilians play a crucial role, both to insurgents and counterinsurgents in conflicts. Uh, and greater external resources reduce the need for civilian support, which should result in increasing civilian victimization. Again, building on prominent work by Weinstein, Stuart and Lou, Zhukov, Sarah Polo, who is discussing here, among others. Uh, importantly, I think, to note about these papers, many of them are studying, Stuart and Lou, for instance, are studying uh, 
you know, when, what happens when insurgents gain a transnational territory. Uh, and I think it's important to, to consider the inverse of that, uh, which is perhaps more common. What happens when, due to counterinsurgent border control and uh, other initiatives like that, when insurgents lose access to transnational safe haven. So that's kind of the flip side that I'm studying today. And the answer is this fortification dilemma. So cut off from external havens, insur insurgents should shift from conventional to irregular tactics, uh, adopting more irregular attacks, reducing conventional attacks, and devoting greater effort to cultivating civilian support from the counterinsurgents populace, uh, cultivating civilian support manifests in the form of reduced civilian victimization. In short, border control trades off reduced insurgent capabilities for greater local competition over civilian hearts and minds. And so counterinsurgents who pursue this strategy have to be prepared to engage in a population-centric effort to undermine the kind of tactical shifts that insurgents will make in response. I'm just uh, showing hypotheses here, restating what I said on the last slide more formally. Um, okay, let's think briefly before I dive into the data about what counterinsurgent border fortification is. This is fundamentally a bundled sort of treatment, right? So we're studying the rollout of border forts in Iraq, but that doesn't just mean the U.S. has built a fort and leaves, leaves it there. Uh, it's really a system of systems. So this is drawing from a, from a CENTCOM document um, showing like kind of different strategies for, for controlling borders, right? And so border fortification is really entails not just the fort and the troops manning it, but also uh, potentially mines, sensors extending out from the fort along the border, uh, UAV overflights, uh, and aerial surveillance, among other things. And in the paper uh, and in the dissertation, this comes out more. Um, but this sort of theory building case is this case of the French effort in the Algerian War of Independence. The French spent uh, 80,000 men and billions of dollars fortifying Algeria's borders with Morocco and Tunisia, where the FLN held substantial bases. Uh, and in response to these efforts, we see the sort of fortification dilemma dynamic play out where insurgents switch from conventional and breaching operations to terrorism in the interior. And they're also uh, pursuing more things like medicine distribution campaigns to win civilian support. Turning now to the context of Iraq, uh, in, in Iraq between 2003 and 2009, Syria and Iran were the most important sanctuaries for insurgents. Jordan and Saudi Arabia are also conduits for insurgent sanctuary, though. Um, deep bathification, uh, specifically coalition provisional authority, order number one, perhaps the most maligned uh, order in, in the entire U.S. occupation of Iraq, it eliminated the Saddam era border guard force. And so throughout 2003, Iraq's borders are left largely undefended. Beginning in 2004, the U.S. started sponsoring border patrol militias, building border forts and setting up this 40,000 uh, strong directorate of border enforcement to kind of reinstate border security in Iraq. Um, and coalition teams, border transition teams were co-located with DBE personnel in the border forts that got built, but smuggling in transnational haven was a problem throughout the conflict. We can see here uh, the kind of course of construction of border forts in Iraq, uh, big peaks in October 2004 uh, and March 2006. And between these two uh, dates is when most of the 297 forts get built. What do they actually look like? Uh, quite literally like a castle, which is somewhat ironic. But again, this includes not just the fort. That's really where the, the border troops are staying. But they're also you know, patrolling outward. There's this whole system of sensors and berms built extending out from these border forts. Uh, and it also includes aerial surveillance. In terms of total numbers of forts, it's greatest in Rutba, in Anbar uh, governorate, uh, and also in um, some governorates along Iran. But we can really see fortification efforts ringing all of Iraq's uh, borders. This is also important because we know that insurgents were actively monitoring border control efforts. On the left, you see a document from, from the Harmony program, uh, which is housed at, at West Point. Uh, and this is from AQI. It's a captured document. It shows uh, specifically that, that 
Al Qaeda in Iraq was gathering weekly reports on enemy locations near the border, the ease of smuggling across uh, at, at checkpoints, the sorts of equipment and, and uh, money and, and fighters coming across. So this is something that's really important to insurgents empirically on the ground. Data in this study are coming from the uh, Iraq Reconstruction Management System, uh, as well as the SIGACT database. Those are both uh, originally obtained by Berman, Shapiro, and Felter, uh, at some, some ESOC researchers. Also studying data on civilian victimization from the World Incidents Tracking System and Iraq body count. Uh, and then lots of control variables coming from various NGO studies, specifically the UNICEF, uh, the multi-indicator cluster surveys are, are very important. Uh, and then again, um, additional data on, on price-weighted oil reserves from Berman Shapiro and Felter. Another interesting and new contribution that I'm making here is uh, that I have received from CENTCOM a map of insurgent smuggling routes in Iraq, uh, and I've geotraced it so we can identify at the district level where insurgent uh, smuggling routes were, were densest. The red routes you see are primary routes, and blue uh, are routes identified by CENTCOM as secondary or alternate routes. The red routes all follow major highways through, through existing ports of entry in Iraq. Uh, blue routes, however, are mostly informal paths and don't follow existing road networks. Uh, and this is another thing that, that moderates So the empirical strategy is a diff and diff. Uh, leveraging spatial and temporal variation in the rollout of fortification. Uh, obviously, fortification is not random, right? It is strategic. Um, but building on this work by uh, Renard Sexton, uh, reconstruction spending is subject to quasi-random bureaucratic obstacles in disbursement. So it's, it's fairly exogenous at the monthly level, whether or not a district will, will have a border fort completed. And that's when the treatment turns on. Um, tests provided in the paper suggest the parallel trends. Uh, assumption is satisfied. There are some, some trend breaks possible. So as always, uh, with this sort of work, you know, we want to be careful with interpretation. Uh, but there's no evidence that other policies are changing with fortification. So that lends some additional confidence in the identification strategy. Uh, and the basic estimate is as follows. Um, I won't go into the details, but you can see the equation. So jumping right into the main results, uh, here the, the DV is that tactical substitution. So for irregular attacks, we're taking insurgent indirect fire incidences. These are things like mortar and rocket attacks, which entail substantially lower risk because insurgents can, can set up the mortar in a field drop it and leave. Um, in some cases, they were even freezing mortars at the top of the mortar tube uh, so that they're 20 minutes down the road. By the time the ice melts, the mortar drops down the tube and it fires. Um, so these are, these are kind of substantially less risky, uh, irregular sorts of attacks versus direct fire incidents are going to be gun battles within the line of sight of US troops entailing substantial risk to, to the insurgents. And so this is the number of indirect attacks, indirect fire attacks over the total number of insurgent initiated SIG acts against coalition forces. Uh, and across all models, different samples of, of districts in Iraq, we can see a, a large positive effect indicating that border fortification is associated with this substitution from conventional direct fire attacks to indirect fire attacks. Um, we can look at this a different way, which is just like attack counts. Uh, conventional attacks uh, are decreasing. Guerrilla attacks or irregular attacks are increasing. And again, insurgent civilian victimization also lower. Insurgent smuggling networks importantly mediate this effect. So in the first row, uh, we see the effect of, of border forts when there are no insurgent rat lines or, or smuggling networks available uh, that could provide additional means of, of securing resources from abroad uh, without being interdicted by the kinds of border fortification efforts going on. Uh, and so there we see, again, as expected, reduced civilian victimization, increased share of, of irregular attacks. However, uh, looking at column or row two in particular, uh, when insurgents have access to these alternate rat lines where, where smuggling would shift as pressure on primary routes increases, uh, border fortification has the direct opposite effects, and that suggests that insurgents are 
you know, using the secondary rat lines to secure resources from abroad uh, via smuggling networks um, in a way that, that the border forts are not interdicting. So this is, I think, a really interesting uh, and fairly intuitive result, uh, which suggests that, you know, smuggling networks are really important to, to insurgent production of violence. Some additional results uh, available in the paper uh, and that I've been working on more recently. So the effects are driven by reductions in the most indiscriminate forms of violence. If we think that insurgents want to uh, cultivate greater civilian loyalties, they should be reducing these most indiscriminate forms of violence. And actually we see that more discriminate civilian victimization, things like assassinations, hostage takings and kidnappings are positively signed though imprecisely estimated. So it's only really things like armed assault, uh, physical assaults, that are that are uh, being reduced. The effects are driven by Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, uh, which are the districts where insurgents gathered or ha held sanctuary. Um, it, there's no effect in districts near Kuwait, where there was no sanctuary, or near Iran, where Iranian forces were engaged in active subversion of border control efforts, sometimes actively uh, intervening with military forces to kind of deter U.S. operations along the border. Um, the, the implication here is that active sponsorship might actually deprive rebels of the need to cultivate civilian ties, perhaps to the rebels' detriment. Uh, and then finally, we see that the effects are increasing in counterinsurgent spending on education, healthcare, governance, and electricity, uh, which suggests, again, the imperative of a population-centric approach to be paired with border fortification, given the, the tactical adaptations that insurgents make. Some robustness placebo tests show that there's no effect of border infrastructure projects or directorate of border enforcement academies, which were not really about interdicting transnational logistical bases. Uh, and the substitution effect we know from these placebo tests is not merely driven by the presence of more fixed installations, which are an easy target for indirect fire. Uh, the results tentatively hold with course and exact matching. This is something that, that uh, I'm working on more uh, going forward. And then some next steps, I hope to leverage exogenous variation in nighttime atmospheric dust, which also aided uh, smuggling. Most of the smuggling is happening at night and on dustier nights. Uh, it's more difficult for Iraqi forces to patrol the border. Um, so that's the next step, as well as interviews with coalition border transition team members. Uh, so conclusion, insurgents, transnational havens, and smuggling networks are central to conflict dynamics, and hence, are a subject of contestation in and of themselves. Border fortification can diminish insurgent resources. That's a good thing. But it can also induce insurgents to compete more for local civilian loyalties. And that's a bad thing. Uh, the implication is, again, that counterinsurgent border control has to be used in tandem with a population-centric approach. So thank you again. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, and comments. So. Trying to turn off the stage there. All right. Thanks, Chris. Great presentation. Um, I'll just I'll go ahead and turn it over to our discussion and get the um, go ahead and get the feedback rolling. Uh, I don't know which one of you'd like to kick us off. But. I'm happy to start. I I kind of organize my comments by uh, theory and then quantitative evidence and your your case studies. Um, so I find the theory uh, the most interesting parts. So maybe we can just start with that. And Sarah, you and I can go move on from there afterwards. Um, so I want to start off my big question for you, Chris. And, and just to preface, I think this is a, a great paper. I mean, you have great evidence. <clears throat> you have novel evidence. I think your, your quantitative tests really make sense and are compelling. And I think this is a theoretically and practically important question, too. So really, I applaud you for this. I think it's really great. So the things I'm going to say really are trying to help you improve this paper and not try to, you know, point out flaws or anything like that. So the first question I have or kind of concern is, like I said, related to the theory. And I want to think a bit about what are alternative explanations for what we could be seeing in the data. And I think you could do a bit of a better job in the paper of going through some of these alternative explanations for why we see tactical variation among insurgent groups. And the first one that jumped out to me is that we're seeing a lot more indirect attacks when you're seeing these border fortresses and, and installations built. But if you were a rational insurgent, isn't that how you'd attack one of these border fortresses? Mm -hmm. That if you're thinking about how you um, 
would take out or distract these forces that are cutting off one of your primary supply lines in a well-defended location, you don't do it with a direct attack where you know you're going to be loose and outgunned with all these things looking at you. You're going to do it in some indirect fashion. So um, I think that kind of just makes a bit more sense in terms of what they might be doing if they really want to take out this installation. And I think you actually see that in your case study too. When you're looking at the Maurice line, at one point you mentioned the ALN also invested a great deal of manpower into operations to breach the line. And so I kind of wonder if that's what we're seeing by these sorts of operations that fundamentally look different from what the insurgents were doing previously. And the second comment about your theory, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Sarah if she has anything she wants to bring up on the theory part of it, is thinking about how cut off the districts are from each other in Iraq. So on the one hand, you have this idea or you're, you're thinking about how easy it is for rebels to substitute and change their tactics. But I don't find you have the same flexibility when it comes to how insurgents can get their resources. That you kind of imagine that they're in a fixed district, they have these primary and secondary rat lines, but can't stuff move throughout Iraq once it gets in? And if we know that Iran is basically always getting stuff in, then why do insurgents need these rat lines? Why can't they substitute internally, either with other relationships with non-state actors or by moving things from one district to the next or even themselves relocating from one district to another. Uh, so I'll kind of leave it there for now. I have some more stuff, but we'll, we'll see kind of where it goes. Right. So first of all, I really enjoyed reading this paper for many reasons, not only because it's a great paper, but also because I am myself working on a project on the unintended consequences of border walls. It's not about counterinsurgency, but I was even more motivated to actually um, reading it. So in terms of the theory, um, I, I have a question about the hypothesis on the effect of border fortification on civilian victimization. Uh, so you're arguing that basically because insurgents are deprived of these external resources, they become sorry, <clears throat> more dependent on the local population. And as a result, they will really produce attacks on civilians, which makes sense. But there is some literature and some of the literature that you cite yourselves that argues that negative shocks to rebel resources actually increase terrorism and violence against civilians. And partly because the kind of sort of more like a governance oriented project and the establishment of this cooperative relationship with civilian take time. And so for these type of resource rich groups that all of a sudden lose these resources, it may be difficult to convert all of a sudden into a completely different type of, uh, of insurgency. So I see that you draw on Weinstein, which is a great theory, but it's sort of relatively static. So we don't really know how the you know, research switch insurgency will behave once they lack these, these resources. Um, and I was thinking about the, the Ethan Wendt the Mosquito model as well, because if I remember correctly, part of the argument is that as the, the, the ability to mobilize goes down, these groups increasingly turn to terrorism, which could also entail, to some extent, attacks on civilians. So I see two stories possibly going on. And the reason why I'm raising this, this question is because it, you know, it comes up in the empirics that you know, I find that there's a bit more mixed evidence uh, or empirically when it comes to this particular mechanism, whereas I'm more sold on the other one when you look at irregular versus irregular uh, uh, irregular attacks. And so in this regard, I was wondering whether it perhaps may make sense to look at whether there's variation short, short term versus long term. Maybe sometimes attack against civilians go up in the short term and then they go down once sort of the, the insurgents adjust. And I have some suggestions about how you can do it with the difference and differences uh, framework as well. Um, and, and the last thing also about this, um, the hypothesis on civilians, it seems that you are sort of assuming that all civilians could be potential supporters, right? And as a result, the groups need to be nice to all the civilians. But thinking about the case of Iraq, for example, I'm not sure to what extent like a Shia or Kurdish citizen would want to support ISIS, okay, Sunni insurgency. So I know it's very difficult to disaggregate targets in this way, but I wonder conceptually whether, you know, maybe, you know, these groups are going to go after the, the enemy, the perceived enemy as civilians, right? And so perhaps there are different categories of civilians and we don't see a reduction in violence in general, but only against specific types of civilians. Um, oh, can I ask one more thing? 
yeah, sure. uh, very quickly. Uh, so I was wondering what, I don't know this data very well, but uh, is it the case that the, the entire border in a district is fenced or maybe only a portion of it? So basically how easy would it be for insurgents to circumvent the fortification if the fortification doesn't run along the um, the entire uh, the entire border and it, you know the the article that you also cite by Gitmanski Grossman and, and, and Wright comes to mind right that so mm -hmm. they show that that has a, as an effect so yeah I guess that's it I have more but I'm happy to send you the, the other about the theory. And Chris, if I can just pile on briefly, <laughs> all the <laughs> just here quickly. Yeah. Um, just two things that were very related to what Sarah just said, which are great comments. Um, but I also wondered about the border forts and how much territory each one is apportioned. Um, and I didn't know anything about this since I, I was Googling it last night and found an NPR article from 2009 where one person, an Iraqi guard manning one of the forts, said they're still too far apart and like they can't really police all the area. Uh, so I wonder if that varies. And then just one more additional point on civilian victimization, too, is that when I was thinking about rates of civilian victimization during the Iraqi insurgency, one of the thing that, things that came out of this kind of classical versus new insurgency literature that was popular like 10 years ago was that a lot of the groups in Iraq don't care about hearts and minds campaigns no matter what. And I wonder if that's true for a group like AQI, and maybe you could explain that. But I didn't see under any circumstances where they're going to wage a full hearts and minds campaign. And, and that was kind of critical to their disagreement with Al Qaeda, actually. Yeah, thank you. Uh, should I take some time to respond? Yeah, yeah, you should take some time to respond before we move on to other, other questions, comments. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll move on then to Evan. Um, yeah, and, and thank you. These are all, these are all really great comments. Um, I, I certainly see the point about negative shocks to rebel resources possibly leading to more violence. Uh, I think in this context, I really need to, to do more to look at like sectarian versus uh, other forms of, of insurgent violence uh, against civilians. I know that like Iraq body count includes some measure of sectarian violence. I'm not sure the quality of it. The other problem is we have like a really really poor data on the sectarian composition of districts as it changed the course of the war and there's a lot of sorting. Um, but this is definitely something that that I, I'm going to think more about and uh, would love to hear you mentioned you had some ideas about variation in long versus short term effects and would, would love to hear more about uh, how you how you propose to study that. Um, but I think the sectarian side could be a promising avenue for me. Uh, is the whole border fenced? This is a great question. Uh, obviously, in some of the smaller districts, it's relatively easy to, to throw up sensors around like the entirety of the border. And uh, if you look you know, at the maps in the paper, uh, some of the borders, especially along Iran, are quite small. Uh, Rutba is a different story, right? This is like mostly a desert expanse along Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, and Syria. And so that was the entire border was not fenced. The, I've heard, and this is where interviews are going to be more helpful, but I've heard like between 20 and 40 kilometers apart sometimes. But again, they're, they're flying kind of aerial surveillance missions in between forts uh, using UAVs and stuff like that can stay in the air, that can stay in the air for a long time. Um, so I think to some extent, there's still like interdiction in between forts happening. Uh, and, and the U.S. was deploying and the Iraq was deploying like kind of teams to go out uh, when they detected on the sensors border crossing like these electronic sensors are probably uh, the most important thing in the the areas farther from forts uh, they also became a tool for the insurgents I, I i know of at least one story where aqi basically pushed a bunch of flocks of sheep and goats uh across the border from syria and then triggered us like howitzers uh, to hit the area, the sheep all die, and then the shepherds join the insurgents sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, I will try and have more discussion about what's happening in between the areas where the border forts are located. One challenge here is that I don't have precise geolocations on where the forts are. Um, you can get this for like the 2012 to to 2014-ish period, um, 
the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency has a data set that identifies the actual locations of Iraqi border forts, but in the 2003 to 2009 period, they won't declassify where the forts they're building precisely are. Um, but anyway, that's that's something that I need to talk more about in this paper. Um, so thank you. Uh, so again, how much territory is each fort allotted? Hoping interviews will clarify this for me, but uh, I've heard like 20 kilometers in between is, is the most common number. Um, so yes, you're right completely that stuff is moving throughout Iraq. Um, the why can't insurgents resupply internally? They can to some extent with with arms and funding. Uh, what is really key for controlling cross border territory is getting foreign fighters in uh, and also kind of across the border to hide from from um, you know U.S. operations in Ramadi, for example. Um, and so the the kind of safe havens where you can melt away from the path of counterinsurgency and also foreign fighters that are coming in, especially from Syria, uh, are, are two things that you can't really recoup internally. Um, foreign fighters obviously are, are more skilled than the local fighters being recruited. Uh, but again, I think that's, that's a great point and, and something I also need to talk more about because uh, I'm not really distinguishing between like arms, money, or, or the other things that you really need in Extra. And finally, one quick point uh, on yes, that. Is, sure. while, we're, while we're here, maybe we have more of a discussion on it. Um, but if you can theoretically, I guess, or practically make a claim about what is most commonly moving across particular borders, and you do a nice job of disaggregating the borders according to which country they're, they're touching. But if you know most fighters are coming from Syria, for instance, then maybe you'd expect patterns of violence right there to look a bit different. And then maybe in that case, if it was primarily fighters, you wouldn't see the types of operations changing in the same way versus where it's material or something like that. So I don't know if you could also leverage that. And obviously you can't get specific numbers of that sort of stuff, but it could be useful to disaggregate it. Yeah, I think qualitatively I can look at some of the stuff in Harmony and um, and the, the, the kind of related projects on, on foreign fighters where there are like some lists of number of people coming in by month and things like that. Um, one thing I will say is that in the, the border districts uh, or the border emirates as, as AQI called them, the foreign fighters would come in, but they'd only spend maybe a night or two there. And most of their fighting is not happening in the border region. They're going to Mosul, they're going to Baghdad where they're carrying out the, like, so, right? So the, the foreign fighters are not being used for fighting in the border region um, for the most part. Uh, so I think that's why we still see this, this tactical substitution. Um, yeah, this point about, yeah, it's obviously you've built like a fort. And so that's a really convenient target for mortar and rocket attacks because it's a fixed installation. That's, that's a great point. Um, one thing that gives me some confidence is that in the placebo test where we look at Directorate of Border Enforcement Academies, uh, those are also fixed installations where it's, again, easier to just launch a bunch of mortars and rockets at them. Uh, and we don't see the same effect happening. Um, so, you know, I, and, and maybe I should do more in the placebo test and look at like police stations or something like that. And those are also fixed installations. Do we see the same kind of tactical shifts? Um, but yeah, this is, this is, that's a great point and something that I do need to think more about. Um, and on the academies, I mean, I thought the placebo tests were really useful um, and a great addition to the paper. But when it came to the academies in particular, those are quite different installations, right? I don't know if they're as well defended or if as hardened as these border forts are. Um, and I don't, and because of that, you might attack them in a kind of different manner. And the second thing is if they're not actually being used to influence your supply lines or degrade them, then you might also not care about attacking them as much or you might devote fewer resources to it as well. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's a great point. Um, that said, like, why not kill a bunch of trainees who are going to go out and man the forts that you are concerned about? Um, yeah. But no, I, I think that's, that's, that's a great point and something that I need to, to think more about um, when I talk about the placebo tests. So thank you for that.
Any more comments or thoughts on the theory? I don't want, I want to make sure that we get everything in before we move on to other parts of the paper. Yeah, pretty good for me. Um, I, I think one of those one of those comments which we didn't really talk too much about is whether or not, you know, I, I, mean, I still don't totally understand why all rebel groups will want to have hearts and minds campaigns. Yeah. Um, and that's still something that kind of is an implicit assumption, I guess, underlying your theory is that you'll do that because of the resources. And um, I think you could, once again, with some case studies or even just talking about AQI, prove that point, even for the people who find that are a bit skeptical about that. But um, that was one of the bigger things for me that was kind of stuck out. Yeah, and um, I will say I, I'm working on the case evidence more now. The leaders of AQI, or at the time ISI, after um, uh, Zarqawi, um, are, are concerned about the kind of counterproductive civilian victimization that some of the lower level fighters are engaging in. So I think at the level we see after Zarqawi, who's kind of this you know, singular and, and super violent uh, sectarian figure, uh, we see that like subsequent leaders are concerned about civilian victimization in a way that's consistent with this, the theory. But um, yeah, I will definitely do more uh, on the case studies. I can also look at like Jaish al Mahdi or some of the Sadr, the Sadrist groups, like the Mahdi army. Um, yeah, I think that'd be really helpful. So should we move on to the quantity of evidence? And yeah, I think that's it. Sarah, Sarah, do you want to start off this one? Sure. Um, so I guess I'll start with the uh, identifying assumptions for the, um, the diff and diff. Um, because it, it seems like that you may want to do a little bit more to demonstrate the plausibility of the parallel trans assumption because it's so important for the diff and diff. It like really hinges on that. And right now in the paper, you have a very sort of short paragraph and you refer to something that is in the, um, in the appendix. And, and particularly because you have a staggered diff and diff, the visual sort of plots, they tend to be very messy, as you have noticed yourself. There's a lot of noise. It's difficult to sort of see clearly, even if it, there is, even if you know the, the assumption holds, but it's not as clear uh, from those plots. And there are ways I think that are more convincing, and particularly if you could leverage a more explicitly lags and leads of the of the treatment, and particularly thinking about sort of a treatment sort of sliding window where you have dummies for whether um, a district month, I guess that's your unit of analysis, is n months away from receiving the treatment and zero otherwise. So you have basically in, in a plot, it would look like you have dummies at, at, at center at zero and then minus one, minus two, minus three, and then plus one, plus two, plus, plus three. And then you basically, when you estimate these betas, they will be the difference between the treated and control. And what you want is for these betas to be zero in the pre-treatment period. If you can show that those betas are zero in the pre-treatment period, you're done, right? So that's, that's great. Um, and so that would be, I think, a more convincing test. And you can do it as a test, but you can actually embed this in a non-parametric difference and difference design, right? That's basically this. I can recommend some papers that uh, uh, that have done it, um, if you want. And uh, and it's nice because in that case you can sort of kill two birds with one stone. You can show basically the the plausibility of this identifying assumption, but also you can check for nonlinear effects, right? You don't you're not assuming that the effect of the treatment is linear in the post uh, in the post treatment period. So you can actually see if maybe it goes up and then down, and, and so it's quite uh, it's quite nice in that. Um, in that sense, and, and sort of along those lines, I looked at Figure S six, which you have in the um, in the uh, in the appendix, um, and and I have a question because in that in that um, in the figure, you compare the units that were never treated with units that were not yet treated, but it's not clear to me because it seems to me that most of the border districts at some point were treated. Mm -hmm. At least looking. Judge, so what is the baseline in that figure? What are these units that were never treated? Are these the internal district? I would not uh, include those districts in the analysis in general because they can never get a border uh, fortification. To, they, these are very different districts. They're sort of qualitatively different. So you can either focus only on the border ones or even, I've seen it done as well in published articles, looking at 
districts that at some point receive the treatment and then mm -hmm. looking at basically at the variation in the timing. And so you have a more homogeneous okay. reference category in terms of districts that are not yet treated, but at some point will be treated because the decision to fortify, as you said, is strategic and the district that get a fortification are probably quite different from the ones that never ever got a, a fortification. Uh, I have more, but I will pass it over to Evan so I don't take all the time. So if I could, so if I could two finger off of a couple of the things that, that Sarah mentioned, I, I had a sim I had some similar thoughts I read through the paper. So one thing is I would, I would definitely, this is presentational, but I would definitely move the parallel trends graph into the body of the paper. Because okay. I, I can't imagine that any, you know, one reading this paper is not going to just immediately want to go to the appendix and look at it. Um, and, and I and I think it works favorably for you, right? It's a night like it it illustrates that the you know the trend is pretty parallel. I mean, it, they're not just parallel; they're right on top of each other, right? Um, and then uh, I so I I think I think Sarah's suggestion about um, sort of what is the appropriate control group is exactly right. I, I had a similar, I had, an, had exactly the same reaction when I read through. So I just wanted to sort of emphasize that that I'm cur you know I'm sort of curious about what these what these units are that are never treated and whether or not they're comparable to the units that eventually get treated. Um, and a final, very quick thought, you know, I hate to sort of suggest something, you know, to the, add to the paper, the paper's already, you know, I, I think the, the empirical analysis is really tight as it is. Um, but this seems like a really good use case for the synthetic control approach, right? So I don't know if you thought about that, but it's probably relatively, it would be relatively easy, I think. And also this would sort of help to uh, address Sarah's comment about sort of what, you know, because obviously the diff and diff regression is implicitly weighting the controls at any given time, but it would be really nice to sort of use the, you know, that method, you know, as just like a supplement. I mean, you could just put it in the appendix. Um, it, it, it might sort of, it might sort of help, um, you know, sort of triangulating at the result from a lot, a lot of different ways. So I just wanted to jump in with those thoughts. I'll pass it over to Evan or maybe, maybe Sarah had a can I just add, yeah, two finger on the synthetic control uh, because there is a uh, there's a it's a called generalized synthetic control method. Yes. Basically, the extension of the a body into the you know the staggered different diff world. Uh, I've used it myself, so um, you know that might be a, a way to uh, complement the the analysis. And it's nice because that method I, I think is robust to potential violations of the parallel trend function. Yeah, I'll I'll third that. I also have a paper using that, and it's okay. it's very nice. Yeah, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll fourth that just because it sounds good. Um, All right, Evan. Yeah, hey, Chris. Um, so just for that to add on to one of the things that Sarah said, I think it'd be a really great idea to almost interact your treatment, uh, your independent variable with time, months away from the creation of the fort. And what that would do is, is two things. So ideally, the beta on the on your treatment kind of the months before it was created, you'd find no effect. So in terms of the months since the creation of Ford, I think you might find an increasing effect in, you know, or like a positive or negative coefficient, depending on what your outcome is. Because one of the concerns I had is that it takes rebel groups time to, time to adjust their tactics. So what you're going to see at one month after the fort versus 10 months after the fort might be different. And for some of these changes, you'd expect some time to, to, you would expect the group would need some time to readjust and to change what they're doing, whether that changes in civilian victimization or in the types of operations. So they surely have some material left over and they're not waiting day to day for new supplies to come in. So you should see that increasing over time after the fort is created. Um, well, I kind of had two points more broadly about the data and about how we're thinking about some of these cutoffs when new forts are created. And the first one is, and you can kind of do this with some quality of evidence, but when I was reading this, I was wondering how clear the break is before and after forts are created. That you'd imagine that if the U.S. government is going in and building a fort in some contested province, something is going to be happening for six months at least before that fort is created. So when you identify your treatment as you know this district this month there's really something happening six months before as well that we have to be aware of that's going to affect what the insurgents are doing so yes you might be able to test for that in thinking about the parallel trends before and after the fort but at least just kind of tell the reader what's going on how long do these forts take uh are you having these clear and hold operations beforehand what's going on and the second thing is um you have good evidence and you have controls that Certain aspects of counterinsurgency don't change with these border fortifications. But I'm wondering if 
more discreet tactics could be changing when border forts are created. And this really came out from your case state of Algeria, but you see the French thinking about two fundamentally different types of defensive operations, an active or kind of more passive uh, patrols. And with the U.S. military thinking around this time, I wonder if they were using the force as jumping off points to launch more active patrols. And in that case, you wouldn't be seeing changes in troop numbers or, or, or kind of discrete metrics, but you'd be say, seeing differences in how they're executing counterinsurgency operations, which could once again change what the insurgents are doing. So you could get at that with interviews with people who are stationed at forts, but thinking about the actual kind of tactics involved from the counterinsurgency side. Yeah, uh, thank you all for these these really sharp suggestions. Um, Sarah, if you do have, have suggestions of citations, either for the lag and lead approach or for the generalized synthetic control, uh, please send them my way. That sounds really useful. The the test I cite in the paper, Cerulli and, and Ventura uh, 2019, is a, is a version of the lag and lead approach. So I should probably put some of the outputs of that test uh, in, in the paper as well. Uh, and I, I agree, I, you know, I have struggled with kind of like how to visualize this parallel trend uh, the best way. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for the feedback there. I will do it again with like only looking at governorates that districts and governorates that get forts and things like that. Um, I hadn't thought about synthetic controls before, but I think again, uh, that, that sounds like a promising avenue. Um, one question for you all would be, you know, like would matching assuage concerns as well or or like you see synthetic controls as a better route than matching i mean i think the the concern here is unobservable time invariant heterogeneity right and matching is not going to do anything uh i mean you know ma matching is not going to do anything there um the 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 generalized synthetic control is a it's a generalization of the sort of um, two-way fixed effects estimator you're using. So that might be a nice way to complement the analysis. Um, I think you can think about sort of building the evidence, right? So if you can show yeah. several different tests that sort of all point in the same direction, even though maybe no single test is perfect, but because it's so much such, you know, consistent evidence, that supports the plausibility of the assumption, I think that would convince uh, a reader, a reviewer. Yeah. Because you already have pretty strong qualitative, you know, it's like, it, I, I like reading the paper, I believe that this mechanism is happening, right? And then, so then we just kind of want to show us that it's happening at an aggregate level in the data. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then Evan, thank you. So again, I think it's a good, good suggestion to look at like what's happening before forts. If I recall, don't don't quote me on the precise number, but it's about like 40 some odd days that it on average that it takes to complete the, the fort. Um, so obviously that's time enough for insurgents to ob observe and, and potentially anticipate um, and, and possibly contest construction. Although I don't think that there are instances in the data where like construction is stopped by insurgent violence on the site. Um, but there were, like qualitatively, there were instances of U.S. contractors on construction projects being killed by insurgents and things like that. So um, I will definitely dive into that more. Um, yeah. So, yes. yeah. If I may add, I think it is, I had a similar comment about anticipation effects, not only in the same district, but also insurgents in neighboring district observing what is happening. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. they will get a fortification too. And I think this is really important to look into this because it is in itself a potential source of violation of parallel trans assumption because you see that the trends basically start to diverge before the treatment is actually in place. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to study things like this, which are interesting and obviously strategic. And, you know, um, we could study, you know, some random weather shock or something to cross border supply. But I think the more common and probably more interesting things that are happening are the deliberate things. So, um, yeah, that's a great suggestion to look at neighboring districts as well.
So we've got about five minutes left. So maybe want to uh, make sure that we get all the feedback. So Sarah, Evan, if there's any sort of other points that you want to make sure that we hit. Um, I guess table two in the paper where you disaggregate different types of civilian victimization. I'm not 100% sure that you need that. Uh, and part of the reason is because there are different ways of interpreting those different types of attacks, sort of bombing. Like some people might say, well, you know, a physical assault can be highly selective. Why would that be indiscriminate? But on the other hand, bombing is much more indiscriminate. But then the results are a little bit. So I see that that. No, that provides a little bit mixed evidence, but I'm not sure what it adds to the theory. I'm not sure that you need that additional step. Um, um, and, and yeah, Chris, thinking about other things I kind of like to see in the paper, just a little bit more discussion. I think you could do a bit more of the Sons of, Sons of Iraq program. Um, that was just jumping out to me as something that you mentioned as controls. We don't really discuss the effect of it. And once again, that's something that um, I want to know more about what your exact controls were, how you thought about that theoretically, and how that could be related to your, your outcomes. And uh, the second thing, I guess, of three uh, that I was thinking of is that I think you could do more to leverage where the border forts are located. I found that to be one of the, the best sections that really kind of address a lot of the questions I have when reading the rest of the paper. Um, but thinking about why the border forts along the Iranian border would be distinct and operate so differently. I think you can maybe dig into those cases qualitatively or even more empirically and just to, or quantitatively to think about why we're going to see differences there. Um, and for me, that was kind of consistent with my expectations about uh, the indirect fire and how insurgents might be attacking them, that we didn't really find any effects there. And it makes sense insurgents don't care about those forts, so they're not going to be attacking them. So therefore, you wouldn't be seeing an increase in indirect guerrilla type operations when you know Iran's is still going to get you the stuff anyway, but you care more about the ones where you have to subvert to still use. And the final thing is, I thought these these maps of rat lines you had from CENTCOM were, were super cool, um, but they also seem pretty vague. Like there are a ton of them. Uh, They're pretty thick lines, and um, I want to know more and if if this is even possible and how confident they are in identifying those. Um, and thinking about the U.S.-Mexico border, I mean, how many times per year do we see news reports of tunnels being found or this and that? And so the U.S. government isn't even confident in identifying all these supply lines on our own border. How confident do we think we are in Iraq and even Afghanistan? Yeah. Um, think, should I respond or since we're shorter on time? Yeah, no, I think we maybe uh, take a take a couple of minutes to okay. kind of round up, respond to everything, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, so so Sarah, Sarah, uh, thank you. Like I t totally see the point about how the results in Table Two could be interpreted a number of of ways. Uh, I will remove the specific hypothesis about discrimination uh, in insurgent civilian victimization for sure, and. Um, would you say axe table two altogether or like relegate it to an appendix somewhere? You can have it in the appendix if you like, but I would not have the specific. Okay. I'm not sure what it sort of adds, to be honest. Um, you, you know, you have enough, I think. <laughs> um. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Evan, yeah, so I, I think I, I do need to talk more about the effects of, of some of the control variables and, and in particular, Sons of Iraq, uh, if I recall, it's in some models associated with, I think, more direct attacks by insurgents. Um, but uh, I, I would have to go re revisit that. I've just been looking at the tables with the kind of controls omitted uh, for, for so long. Um, but I think, yeah, discussing the effects of control variables will be important. Um, I'm glad to hear that you like the, the disaggregation, uh, and I'll, I'll see if I can expand that or maybe move it up in the paper. And then, and then finally, the rat lines. Um, yeah, I was excited to get this map. I don't have many details about like what went into identifying these routes, um, just that it was from multinational forces Iraq, like intelligence analysts who made it in, in January 2005. Uh, and basically, um, 
it identified like what they viewed as the historical roots in Iraq. So the kind of ones that were used in the Saddam regime and, and subsequently. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's cool. Um, and it is like one of the, the more novel, like original data things that I think I can bring to the table. Um, but I, I will, you know, work on getting more, more details there. And, and perhaps the interviews I do will also kind of shed some light on, on smuggling dynamics more. Um, yeah, well, this was a super helpful session. Thank you all for, for the really uh, amazing feedback. I, I'm pretty uh, encouraged like want to get into revisions here so um really excited about that you all have my emails if if anything else comes to mind and and or you want to send a citation my way or something like that i'd really appreciate it uh yeah and look forward to to seeing you all on the conference circuit hopefully in the next few months i'll be at isa if anyone's going to be there sounds great yeah thanks chris we're at 11 so uh it's quitting time um, I want to thank, uh, thank Chris for the excellent work and for sharing it with us. And I also want to thank uh, Sarah and Evan for their fantastic feedback. Um, I think this is a really cool project. I look forward to, to seeing it in print. I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing the other components of the dissertation. It sounds really, really cool and interesting work. Um, thanks for sharing it with us. So uh, if you want to tune in uh, next week uh, at the same time, we'll have, uh, that'll be March uh, 6th. We'll have Rob Williams, who's a postdoc at uh, WashU in St. Louis. He's going to be presenting a paper called The Curse of Geography, How Governments Prevent Secession Attempts. Uh, as a reminder, you can find us on all of the usual outlets. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can find us on Apple Podcasts. You can also find uh, copies of the papers uh, if you're interested in reading more about the work that you've seen. You can find those papers uh, posted to the OPSC website. Um, and also, if you're interested, we can always use additional discussants. So if you're interested in volunteering uh, to discuss, shoot an email to Cassie and I, and we'll be happy to have you on. Um, until next time, thanks. <laughs>